So, good morning again, everyone. So, as the, indeed, as the only thing literally standing between you and lunch, I'll try to make this entertaining, or at least informative. Um, so, I'll more or less uh, pick up where Waitao left off, and I will talk about the generalized Ponchan equation. Before I start doing that, I just want to thank the organizers again for putting this uh, excellent school together and including me in it. And now let's talk about the science. So the starting point is something that was already mentioned several times, especially on the first day, and that is that what Colin Chen achieved in 1965 can be thought of as a map, a map between the interacting system and the fictitious non-interacting system. Now what do I mean when I say map? When I say map, I mean that it's density conserving. And what does that mean? That the ground state density of the real system is the same as the ground state density of the fictitious non-interacting system. Now that's great, and it's not at all obvious in the sense that if we didn't know that and we asked ourselves, well, is it really reasonable that we can map every system in that way, subject to some caveats, then, you know, it's not so obvious that the answer is yes, and that's part of the magic of the function construction. But now we can ask ourselves an even further question. We can ask ourselves, is this the only way? And naturally, the answer is no, or this would have been a really short talk. <laughs> So, where can we push forward? Well, we can ask the following question. Can we gain flexibility while still retaining the same and effective single electron picture? got to give, so what we will have to sacrifice is that the map system will remain non-interact. Otherwise, we're just doing Tom Sham all over it. So the big idea is that we are going to map to a density conserving partially interacting, and I will explain what that means as I go along. electron gas, but one that is still represented by a single slider determinant. And this representation by a single slider determinant is what will allow me to retain some effective single electron picture. Now, where does this big idea come from? It comes from Zayda Atar, that's a physical PR at all, from 1996. And let me mention that the Atar includes Mel Levy, who is here, and also Andy Gerlin, who was mentioned uh, several times uh, during this workshop. So, uh, in the same uh, uh, tradition of previous co uh, talks, I will not go into issues of the representability and stuff like that, although that is certainly discussed in the original article, so you can learn more about that from the original article. Instead, I will show you what is the idea of this map and how it can be done. So our starting point is an auxiliary energy functional. of a slater determinant. So I have some functional S of some single slater determinant phi, which I can equivalently write as some functional of the orbitals that make up, single electron orbitals that make up this single slater determinant. 
So this seems rather abstract, so let me give you two examples of what this functional could be, and I'll introduce a third one later. So one simple functional can be, so now it's a for example. So for example, S of phi can just be the expectation value of the kinetic energy operator. Or a second example, it can be the expectation value of the kinetic energy operator and the electron-electron repulsion operator. And as I said, other examples will follow. But here are two examples. Now, this is not a density functional. We actually move back here. So I'll keep those for something else. Now, this S is not a density functional. It's a functional of the slater determinant. But we can define a related energy function. A related density. What would that be? So in the same spirit of the Levy constraint search, which we already heard about as well, we will define a function of the density that is related to S. That's why this subscript S is here. And it will be the minimum over all Slater determinants that integrate to a certain density of S of phi. In other words, out of all determinants that can go into this function of S, let's only focus on those that integrate with the density and choose the one that minimizes that uh, S functional, and that would be the value of this F S function. And again, equivalently, I can write it as a minimum over the individual orbitals that make up this way to so that's completely cool. Okay. Now, with this, we are ready to go and generalize the equation. Now I will use both boards uh, here. One will be for the model system, so the fictitious system into which we will map our results. And the other will be for the real system. So let's start with the real system because, after all, we're trying to do something real here. So in the real system, we already know that the ground state energy would be given by a minimum over all densities integrating to the correct number of particles in the system of f of n plus an integral over the external of r, n of r. This we've already seen several times. And the F is the Holmberg Horn function. Question? Just to give a notation. So we have here, when you have say phi, mm -hmm. it's the cone chain of your function. No, phi is a single slider determinant. Okay. At this point, I know nothing else about it. It's just a single slider determinant may or may not coincide with a cone chain single slider determinant. And psi is the real function of the system. Right. Okay? Okay, so this is for the real system. Now, step number one, we're going to rewrite this in a slightly different way. <clears throat> this unknown f of n, we're going to separate into two parts. The first part is the fs, which we define over there. And the second part is rs. r stands for remainder. <coughs> Together, they're just the original f of n. I just separate it into two parts. One is with whatever this f of s that I defined over there is. And the other is everything else needed to bring me back to the original f of n. That's it. Okay, now I go to the model system. And in the model system, I will try to minimize over n. Again, integrating to the right number of particles. <coughs> but I will only minimize over f S of n. In other words, I will toss out this Rs of n. So now, you see why I call it a partially interacting system, because I kept some of the interaction energy, some of what describes anything beyond the external potential, but not all of it. There is a part that I chose to toss out. So generally, of course, this is now a different system. 
I wanted to still wanted to yield the same density as the original system, which means that I have to replace this external potential by some effective potential that remains to be found in the hope that I, just like in the original function scheme, I can identify an effective potential such that the minimum density that minimizes this fictitious system is the same as the density that minimizes the real system. Yes? When you bring your fs as a functional of the density, whereas your s is a functional of uh, slavery in terms of Yes. You haven't told us what fs is. And fs, is, yeah, it's still over here. It's the minimum over all slater determinants integrating or which yield a given density. Okay? So now it's a well-defined density functional, but of course it's defined using this auxiliary definition of this S function. Okay? And will vary for a different choice of this. Okay. So now let's continue with this model system. Now I can write the ground state here as the minimum of n goes to n. And now I can write explicitly what fs is. As just said, it's the minimum of phi going to n. So, so it's going to little n of s of phi. And the rest is the same. So now I can write this Again, in the spirit of, of the constraint search that we've heard about, if there's a two-step process here, all phi is going to n and all n is going to capital N to the total number, then I can say that this is just the minimum over all single electron orbitals that together, when lumped in a single Slater determinant, give me this correct number of electrons. Minimum of S of phi i plus integral dr v effective of r and which I remind myself also really depends on the same set of orbitals because that's what comprises the density. And now I want to ask myself, okay, then I just have one final step here and that is very well, which orbitals would it take to minimize this energy, subject to the usual constraint that I want to keep the uh, orbitals uh, orthonormal. So I have this procedure of Lagrange multiplication. That's the only step here that I will not do in detail, simply for lack of time. I'll write down the result and I'll immediately explain it. So right now let me first just write it. So let me explain what's going on. The first term you see, well, there will be something multiplying or rather acting on phi j. And it's going to be some, in general, complicated uh, non-multiplicative operator, which I can't yet write out in more detail because it will depend on what s is. I'll show you specific examples in a moment. So about this one, let's just say that specific examples to follow. Specific examples. This part is pretty obvious. I just take the derivative with respect to n and then the derivative of n with respect to phi. So the chain rule, so the first part just gives the effective and the second one the sound phi j. And the third part, so this is just functional derivative. And the last part really comes from the Lagrange multiplier. And if you're thinking about, okay, where did the Lagrange multiplier show up? So think of it as basically the same as in hartree fock theory, where you get an equals epsilon j phi j for the same reason. So you can ask me more about the math later if you'd like. Right now, let's step forward under the assumption that this uh, variation is okay. Now we go back to the real system. In the real system, we can do pretty much the same thing as we've done for the fictitious one. Except, of course, we have the external rather than the effective, and we have this additional functional, the density, this remainder function. 
which also depends on S because what the remainder is depends on what part went into the surface. So now I can again write the ground state in two steps as a constrained search. So I'm again writing Fs explicitly as the minimum over all orbitals uh, in yielding or all slayer determinants yielding m, s of phi, plus rs of m, plus integral over the extension. And again, I can write it as basically a minimization over all single, layer, single electron orbitals that eventually yield the given density capital M. And it's a minimization of S of phi i plus Rs, which depends on M, which itself depends on phi i, uh, plus an integral over the exponent. M, and again, M itself depends on phi. Excellent. And now again, I'm saying, okay, which orbitals will minimize this? So again, I do the same Lagrange trick, and what will I have? I will have the same to be specified operator as before, for the same reason. From Rs, what I will get is some vr times phi j, so some multiplicative operator. How do I know that? Well, that's just the chain rule again, and this vr is just the functional derivative of this remainder functional with respect to the density. Just like the exchange correlation potential is the functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy with respect to the density. Okay. Now, here I have the external, phi j, and again the Lagrange multiplier will give me epsilon j phi j. So now, all I need to do is compare the two. And I notice that if I want the final equation here, and the final equation here to be the same, then all I have to do is realize that the effective is really the sum of the external and the remainder. In other words, what should be the effective potential in the fictitious equation? Now let's write it here. It should simply be the sum of the real external potential plus this remainder potential. So ultimately, the generalized Poincham equation is this general operator, which is to be specified for specific cases, plus the external, plus the remainder. And again, this is either the PRB. Now, all this is fairly abstract. So now I will turn the abstract into something that's hopefully useful with the help of three special cases. Well, not with this one I want. Let's put this on the side. That's better. So, special case one. Suppose that S of phi is indeed the first example that I gave. It's just a single Slater determinant expectation value of the kinetic energy operator then I actually already know what variation of this yields. This would mean that this mysterious operator that I kept writing, in this case, is just minus tail square over 2 in atomic units. Because I'm taking the derivative of the kinetic energy uh, expression with respect to individual orbitals. So I have 5j star minus tail square over 2 phi j. 
and this is what will remain, this is what will act on a given function. So, this is this operator. Now, what can I choose for V remainder here? Again, this is an exact equation, so there is some exact V remainder. Well, I can choose to express it as V hard tree, because that's usually an important component, as you know, plus everything else. And I can give this everything else a name. Already has a name. It's called the exchange correlation uh, potential. So you see that now if I plug all of that in, what do I get? Get minus del squared plus V external plus V hard tree plus V exchange correlation phi i equals epsilon i phi i. Hey, we already know this equation. It has a name. It's called the Concham equation. So, lesson one, KS is just a special case of GKS. And of course, the just here is with quotes because it's a very, very important special case, both practically and historically. But you see that it can be derived as, this, as a special case of the more general form. So let's do something more interesting than just an unnecessarily complicated proof of something we already know. The second special case would be the other example that I started with, which is T plus E. Now, we also know actually what the uh, mysterious operator would look like. Because we know that taking the uh, uh, minimization or the constraint minimization with the Lagrange constraint of this expression with respect to the orbitals is actually how we derive the hartree fock equations. It's exactly how we derive the hartree fock equations. So without proof that is in every textbook, let me write down the result of the kinetic energy operator which comes from the T part. And the VEE part gives us two things. It gives us the hartree potential which has a density, which comes from the density that comes from the orbitals, and it gives us the fog operator, which is a non-multiplicative operator which can be written in this So the usual non-local exchange integral of our three fog So now, if we put that into the general uh, formulation of the GKS equation, which is still on the top left, then I see that what I have is the following. I have minus del square over 2 plus the ion, or the external, to be consistent, plus the heart rate, Plus this non-local clock operator, all of this, this one and this one and this one are all coming from this OS. So now there is a B remainder, which is a function of the density and is a multiplicative potential. And all that acting on phi i of R will give me epsilon i phi i. So this equation, in fact, has a pretty long name. It's known as the Hartree Falk Con Shen equation. Why does it have this weird name? Because, say for this term, it's the Hartree Falk equation. But now we go beyond the original theorem of Hartree and Falk by pointing out that, in fact, there is a multiplicative potential which is a functional of the density, which we could add here so as to obtain, yet again, the exact density. So from this point of view, the original Hartree fog theory is just an approximation where instead of choosing VR as what it needs to be, we approximate it quite broadly as zero. 
So we've already heard on the first day that uh, Thomas and Fermi were doing actually some rudimentary DFT without fully realizing it. What's less obvious is that even Harvey and Falk were doing rudimentary density functional theory without realizing it. Still true. And you can see it here. So again, this is in principle exact. Let me point out, and this was already mentioned in Inway Tau's talk, that the exact VR here is not exactly the same as the exact correlation potential of Kong Chan theory. They're close, but they're not exactly the same. Because again, the non-local exchange operator is not exactly the same as the local exchange operator in, in uh, function theory. So again, under standard circumstances, they shouldn't be too far away from each other, but they're not the same. Uh, they will, yes? In Julia, they will be the same. Is that right? OK. No, it's a question. Ah. <laughs> All right. In the, in the helium map, will they be the same? So if the two electrons are of on, yeah, I suppose so. I suppose so. We need to think about it a little bit more, but I suppose so. I think OK is still a good answer. <laughs> All right. So now let's take a third uh, example, which is maybe even less trivial. Now I can choose as this S of phi the kinetic energy as in the previous two examples, but only a fraction, A, of the total electron-electron repulsion, where A is somewhere between 0 and 1. Or actually, let's remove the equality, because if it's exactly 0 or exactly 1, these are the two cases that we've done previously. Now, in the same spirit, now it's very clear what OS would be. I would again get this minus del square over 2 from the kinetic energy operator. Now I would only have a fraction of the Hartree potential. And I would also have the same fraction of the Fock non-local potential operator. Now recall again that this can be matched with some choice of VR that would make it exact. Again, I don't know what that choice is in general. Anymore, you know, just like I don't know what the exact exchange correlation potential is in general. But let's approximate this remainder potential. So suppose that I choose to approximate this remainder potential in the following way. First, I'm going to take a complementary fraction of the hard return. It's probably a good idea to have all of the hard interactions since I only have some of it in this OS operator, let me take the rest of it into my approximation. Nothing's wrong here because this is a local part. VR must be local. This is local in the sense that it's multiplicative. All good. Now, I also choose a GGA exchange, which is again multiplicative. And again, I'll take just a fraction of it, whatever fraction didn't go into the Fock exchange. And now I'll also throw in GTA correlation. So, what do I get if I put all of this together? I get the following equation. Here's minus del square over 2. That's coming from OS. Here's the external. That one's always there. Here's the Hartree. Now in full, because it's just the sum of the two parts, this one and this one. And this one and this one. A fraction of Fock exchange. The complementary fraction of GGA exchange. GGA correlation, and all 
this acting on some phi i will give me epsilon i phi. So there's a name for this. This is exactly what we have explained earlier this morning as a standard hybrid function. And by the way, that this can be uh, also brought into the generalized function picture was pointed out by Berlin again and Levy in follow-up paper in So this has been known for almost exactly 20 years. And what is the lesson to be learned here? So lesson three, an example three. That is that from a GKS perspective, from a generalized function perspective, there is nothing hybrid about a hybrid function. <laughs> You know, the originally the name hybrid was basically meant to suggest that we're mixing and matching uh, hard refock ingredients and DFT ingredients, which we are, no doubt. But whereas for the first few years of its existence, this was viewed as some approximation that takes us away from the true Ponchamp picture, based on this article, we now see that it's still properly within DFT. So it's correct. We're no longer within the Conchamp picture, but that, that is not synonymous with leaving DFT behind altogether. We're still very much within rigorous density functional theory. We're just within its generalized Conchamp framework, Conchamp framework, and we have chosen some approximate form for V. And then just like any other approximation within DFT, we can think about its relative advantages and disadvantages, but there's nothing wrong from the formal point of view with this uh, possibility. So with this in mind, let me wrap up this topic basically by trying to compare GKS Case. What are the relative advantages and disadvantages? And this can be summarized as the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> Let's start with the good. The good is that we have a lot of flexibility in construction. Now there's not one way to do things, there are many ways to do things, and in principle they're all equally correct. And that is because we left the non-interacting picture. And now we rigorously allow non-local operators into the theory. Which is good for some things, for example, for mimicking, say, the uh, self-energy operator in any body perturbation theory that Harvey will be talking about later. So those are the advantages. So that's the good. What's the bad? Well, that exactly is also the bad. Because if I have a lot of flexibility in the construction, there are also many ways to now get things wrong instead of following one specific procedure. Leaving the non-interacting picture also brings some complications with it. There are conceptual advantages to the non-interacting picture. And non-local operators also are complicated to plot, more complicated to understand, and in many situations also more complicated to compute. So, you know, whether something is advantageous or not is somewhat in the eyes of the beholder and somewhat dependent on what exactly it is that you want to do. But the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that it's not a right versus wrong situation. Both are okay, both are legitimate theoretically. It's a question of choice, and the choice may be motivated by many different things, which is again a point that we have uh, alluded to as well in this one. Okay, so what's the ugly? 
The other are two mistakes that you often see in the literature, and I would like to take this opportunity to point them out. One, orbital dependence in the energy functional maybe that's the general. Orbital dependence in the energy functional is not the same as GK. It's not necessarily the same as GK is. What do I mean by that? Suppose I write the hybrid functional energy, which has the Fock energy, which I showed this to you earlier today. And as he mentioned correctly, I could take the derivative with respect to the orbitals, which is what I just showed you, but I don't have to. I can still do OEP and remain fully within the original function. That's one thing. Second thing, the fact that the GKS formalism exists should not be taken as a card launch to you know, write down any orbital dependent expression, minimize it with respect to the orbitals, and say that it's allowed because of the GKS construct. In other words, if you wish to choose, if you wish to use, I'm sorry, GKS, even approximately, there's nothing wrong with that. Hybrid functionals do that, for example. But show us what is SO5. In other words, if you wish to justify this within this framework, tell me where you started from. Then if you have some approximations for uh, the remainder of potential, that's well and fine. In practice, we are almost always approximate density functional theory, and we shall do that. We are doing it in KS, and we are also doing it in GKS, but what type of GKS map is it? So here, uh, let me point out that some further discussion of OEP and similarities and differences with GKS can be found in this review article that I wrote just 10 years ago by now with um, my friend and colleague Stefan. Okay, so that's what I had to say about the generalized function equation. Here, and how am I doing on time? We've got four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. Right. Well, I have the whole lunch break. No, that's the white Oh, okay. All right. So the rest of this discussion was supposed to be dedicated to the. Uh, derivative discontinuity. Obviously, I'm not going to go into a detailed discussion for lack of time. Maybe I'll just make a few quick notes. So this goes back to a concept that was already mentioned, and that is that suppose I have a system that's, say, neutral for a number of particles n. I can add a particle. I can take out a particle. The energy will change. So here is the energy as a function of the number of particles. Now I can ask myself, okay, but what happens between these integer points? And this is a question that was raised and answered by Purdue R. Fargos. Two of the authors are in this room, and this is a PRL from 1980. Okay, so the first question to ask if you're going to answer that question, and again, for lack of time, I will suppress virtually all of the math here to start giving you just a bit, is suppose that the number of uh, electrons when the system is neutral is four. So what does it even mean to have, say, three and a quarter electrons? And one way to think about it, which is very useful, is to think about an ensemble. In other words, if the system is, in, is now open and interacting with a reservoir of particles, that if it has three electrons 75% of the time and four electrons 25% of the time, then on average it will have three and a quarter electrons. So we can think of it that way. And that is what is known in quantum statistical mechanics as an ensemble state, namely a mix, a classical mixture of pure quantum states. So now if we define it that way, what will be the form of the energy interpolating between those integer points? Easy. 
It has to be straight lines. And how do I know it has to be straight lines? Because if it's the classical mixture of pure states, then the energy is lowest when I just take the lowest energy possible for the end states, and I do the classical mixture. It's not going to go any lower than that. So I just have a linear interpolation. So I have a piecewise linear behavior. But this piecewise linear behavior also brings with it something else that's interesting, and that is that you notice that there's a discontinuity here at the integer points. In other words, the curve is continuous, but because of this change of slope, its derivative isn't. So we have a derivative discontinuity at integer points. Now, actually, what is this slope here? It's the energy of the neutral minus the cation divided by 1, really. So this slope here is really just minus the ionization potential. And this slope here, equally well, is just minus the electron potential. And now we see why there is this discontinuity, because, you know, at least it's possible that the ionization, in fact, often it is, that the ionization potential and the electron affinity are the same. So the question is, okay, what would provide this discontinuity in a real calculation? And now, for simplicity, let's stick to the Kant-Sham equation in its original form we just asked. So, this, as I go across the integer point, can introduce a discontinuity because I'm going to start acting on a new orbital. So yeah, some of this, this some of that discontinuity, sorry, can and will come from this. This, well, that's continuous in the density, so that's not going to provide anything. Say here, the R3 is just an integral over the density. What about this one? Well, that's the exchange correlation potential. Remember that this is a not a physically accessible potential. This is a mapping potential. That's what we started with about 45 minutes ago. This is what we started with. Just, this just maps the real system into a fictitious one. So, there's nothing to prevent it from jumping, really. And in this paper, Purdue, Parvek, and Bobo suggested that, in fact, they believe that in many realistic systems it will, something that has since been proven over and over by numerical examples. So, can jump this continuously. In what way will it jump this continuously? So the good news is that at most it can jump by a constant, namely by a spatially independent constant. How do I know that? Because if it jumps by more than a constant, then as I approach the integer point from the left or from, from the right or from the left, I will reach potentials that differ by more than a constant. But I still hope to get the same integer density. So if I will create the same integer density with two potentials that differ by more than a constant, then I will have violated the homework point theorem. So that's not good, so that's not going to happen. However, there's nothing to prevent a jump by a constant. And this constant can be quite significant. So, Kieran, do I have one more minute to make one more observation and then I'm done? Oh, okay. One. One. So, the other thing that you know already, and we've already heard about it, is that there's the ionization potential theorem, also derived from this paper, and that is that epsilon homo is rigorously minus the ionization potential. There's also Yamak's theorem that tells us that epsilon homo is just a derivative of the energy with respect to the number of particles. So, if that's the behavior of the energy, then basically epsilon homo will be a staircase. function, again, for the exact function. So, epsilon homo all the way here will reflect the ionization potential, and epsilon homo all the way here will reflect the electron affinity. But, of course, the electron affinity here, or why will it reflect the electron affinity? Because it's the ionization potential of the anion. The ionization potential of the anion is nothing but the electron affinity of the neutral, barring geometrical relaxation, which I don't allow. So what does that mean? It means that epsilon homo is minus i, that's great, but if I'm on the left of this point, 
that epsilon nu mu is not A. Why? Because as I go across this integer point, I get this jump. This jump is known as delta xc, uh, exchange correlation derivative discontinuity. And that means that epsilon homo minus epsilon lumo is not i minus a, but in fact i minus a is epsilon homo minus epsilon lumo plus delta x, which is a result derived one year later. So that tells you that the Consham gamma, even if you have the exact functional, is not the same as the gap between the ionization potential and the electron. And my final remark, especially as Kieran is already standing up, is that now we can tie this in with the generalized Consham equation that I started with. You see, in the generalized Consham equation, this can be the, the, the kinetic energy as before, it usually is, but can also have additional components which may bring their own discontinuity. Which means that the remainder potential is also allowed to jump discontinuously just like the exchange correlation potential, but by how much it jumps may depend on my choice of operator here. In other words, I can make the jump much larger, much smaller, depending on my choice of operator here. So in, in the research talk, I will show how we put this to good use by, by making choices that allow us to make informed decisions about the derivative discontinuity rather than let the CONCHAM system choose it for us in a system that has that flexibility. So that's it. I'll be happy to answer questions if there's still time. Yes. Just on the, on the comparison between GKS and KS, mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify, are you saying that it's a disadvantage to have flexibility in construction uh, of the GKS method? It, it depends. So generally, of course, from, from uh, let's say, a developer point of view, it's an, it's an advantage. I have more uh, ingredients to choose from and, you know, and, and make informed choices. And in fact, as I just said in my final remarks, I will put that to good use later this week. However, in general, you know, there's also something to be said for a unique recipe. Consham map is one unique map. If you do it and I do it, it's supposed to be the same, unless one of us has a mistake. Whereas in the generalized Consham sense, you can make one choice, I can make another choice. If both are exact, they will both lead to the same density, but other things will not necessarily be common between the two systems. So is that a pro or a con? Depends on what you're trying to do, I think. Uh, let, let me ask a follow-up because I haven't seen you talk about this this way before. You can put the A in where you can put in a fraction of the uh, electron electron repulsion into the S operator. Yes. And then there's also let's say another A, which is the A that people use to that Whitehouse showed us where you mix the uh, fraction of exchange into your energy expression with the GGA. That's right. But these two don't actually have to be the same, right? On the other hand, once you do generalized cone sham, let's say with an A of 25% or something, you are now required to do 25% of exact exchange because you put it into your scheme. Well, yes and no. So what I put formally into my scheme, let me quickly write it again because that's something that I already erased. By making a choice of t plus a fraction of vc, yes. What I have is this, plus a fraction of Hartree, plus a fraction of Fock. So these are now mandatory. That's what I'm saying. But everything, but first of all, I can change my choice of A. So, you know, one map is obtained with, say, a choice of 25% as in PBE, and PB0. Another choice is with, say, 20%, like in B3LIP. It's just a different map. No, 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 I'm saying something different. So, 
So if BP is zero, for example, right? Mm -hmm. I can do it solve the OEP equations. Yes. So I have this choice uh, of how much you exact exchange, and that's very important. Uh, what amount you choose to be or uh, that's right. Bet, right. But uh, once I go to a generalized going channel with an A of twenty five percent, I cannot then go back and approximate the exchange as a density function. That 25%. Right, but what you can do if you want to change 25% to say 20% or 50% or whatever to see what it does, you still can. In GKS language, what this means is that you have reverted to a different GKS map. Right. Yeah, I just want to check that it got more Yes? I believe that the because sometimes when you talk about exact exact change, you just take the French charm of it as and this is exactly changed. But it seems that sometimes we really take the four kind of director, which is something I'm not sure it's a little different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's exact exchange in Hartree Fock theory, or let's say for now in Hartree Fock Concham theory, which is rigorous, and there's exact exchange in the Concham equation. These are different GKS maps. Ergo, both are exact but not in the same way. So the exact definition for exact exchange in one is indeed not exactly the same as the definition of exact exchange in the other. So how can both be exact? Well, because the correlation expression in Concham would not be exactly the same as the remainder potential in hartree fock Concham theory, and the differences between the two will exactly rigorously cancel out the differences between the two exchange terms. And since the only physical thing is the overall energy, then if I can express both exactly, I'm fine either way. So I can get to the same sum through adding components that are slightly different from each other, as long as their sum remains the same. And, okay. and here you, you really find the, the happy folk orbitals. Uh, needs you to make a complete different uh, calculation. I will find the exact Hartree Fock orbitals if I do retroactively what Hartree and Fock did, namely set VR to zero. If VR is any choice other than zero, then my orbitals will be neither exactly the Concham orbitals nor exactly the Hartree Fock orbitals. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My question is a bit of philosophical base. So, okay. so the way this, this is constructed is to give a good foundation of the well-known hybrid functions. Among other things, I will show in the research talk that range-separated hybrid functionals can also be justified with a general assumption. Yes. I'm wondering I mean, somehow this whole construction is a bit asymmetric. And we have the non-local exchange part, and, and we have a local correlation potential. Mm -hmm. If you take a step back and look at this, this doesn't look very promising. Why not? Well, don't we feel that correlation is in a way the harder part of physics, like also from DFT, strict DFT, we know there's an error conservation, cancellation with certain approximate functions. It looks, at least on the surface, it looks like we're treating these two aspects of life, exchange and correlation, in very different ways. Right, I understand. So shouldn't one go for also some, some non-local Correlation expression? Gen non First of all, that may well be possible. It all depends on what this S of phi expression is that you begin with. But, yes. but so, so is there a prospect in that direction? Perhaps. I haven't given it much thought, but perhaps. But what I will maybe make a, 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 another philosophical remark in return, and that is that in a hybrid functional or a range-separated hybrid functional, since we take exactly only part of the exchange, that means that the other part of the exchange we approximate. You know, the remaining fraction or maybe the remaining range, depending on which hybrid it is. 
So that means that there we have the deviation between exact exchange and some approximate exchange. Now the difference between approximate exchange and exact exchange is a form of correlation. So we're bringing correlation considerations back in through the back door. And I'll actually in the research talk I'll show a, a specific example where this type of thinking is directly useful. But indeed, it's well possible that more can be done. And what I'm thinking is, is something that has the exact way of writing the correlation energy, for example, in terms of green functions. Yeah. Or there's other functionals that work with the quantum kinetic energy. So it's also an orbital functional, but of somewhat different nature. That's right. right. Can, shouldn't we aim for getting a non-local correlation potential that captures these? I think that's a very energy. interesting idea, yeah, absolutely. Maybe after we've gone as far as possible with the local, see how good it is. But it's a good point, yeah. Uh, can I, can I, ready? Oh, it's not your turn. Oh, I saw it in your hand. Yes, go for it. He came up with a concept, so I think he gets it right no, here. But I, I like that you can put it out to hybrid, original hybrid is that we are you could say it's T F A, right? A is right. It's a density functional approximation. There is an unknown remainder potential that would have made it exact, which is probably as difficult to approximate as the original exchange correlation one, but there is a useful approximate form. In fact, more than one, because there is more than one useful hybrid function. I just wanted to ask about the relaxation, which is completely neglected in that sheet. So if you can uh, estimate the error on that. Great. If that can be included in the scheme somehow. Thank you for asking that, because that's something that I forgot to mention, and it's crucial. So this ionization potential theorem, is often confused with what in Hartree Funk theory is known as Kopman's theory, which boils down to the same thing. Formula looks the same, but there's a profound difference between the two. And let me tell you what it is. This is an exact theorem. It includes relaxation within an in-principle exact theory, which is DFT. Unlike it, the original theorem due to Kopman's is an approximate theorem, because indeed, as you said, it neglects orbital relaxation, within an approximate theory, which is hard to refock without any remainder potential. So this is actually, even though it superficially looks exactly the same, it's actually a much stronger statement. Okay? One last question. Mm -hmm. uh, we were discussing on the first day the way, the order in which you sort of, the logic of proving one thing from another, that there's more than one way to get at the EH minus I. And the way I introduced it was the decay of density. Yes. Now, in the Hartree Fock, if you do pure Hartree Fock, you have this very strange decay of density where all orbitals, all occupied orbitals, have the same decay element, right? Correct. So presumably your remainder terms and your generalized cone sham become rather important in far away because I assume that EH is still equal to minus I no matter what the eight is, right? Right. That's so right. That, has anybody to check that to look at it? So yes. So what I can say at this point is that there's no general proof for an arbitrary map, so for a whatever S of phi choice. Right. But for Fock and Fock related, so hybrid brain separated hybrid. Right. So yes, this theorem still holds. One can prove that it still holds, and yes, even though there's a more complicated decay. In the end, it's epsilon homo that fixes it. It's a more involved proof, though, absolutely, but it exists. Okay. 
Okay, with that, let's thank all this morning.